Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization dedicated to peace, economic and social justice, good government, and a clean environment. One way of achieving that mission is listening to experts discuss pressing local, national, and international issues. Before COVID struck, Concerned Citizens met regularly to hear these experts. After COVID arrived, Concerned Citizens turned to Zoom, video recording talks, panels, and debates for later broadcast on this channel. Now that COVID is in remission, our main menu is again in-person meetings. But for those of you unable to join us, Village TV is video recording our in-person speakers for later broadcast on this program. In addition, when the right opportunity comes along, Concerned Citizens Presents will continue to offer the occasional remote speaker. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. My name is Suzanne Modell and I'm a member of the committee responsible for these broadcasts. Today, we delve into an exciting topic, universal basic income. Last month, the Sunday New York Times featured an article titled, Guaranteed Income Program Spread City by City. After reading it, I felt our viewers would be interested in learning more about this fascinating approach to reducing the growing income inequality in the United States. So I looked around for an expert. James Pugh is co-founder and co-director of the Universal Income Project, an undertaking devoted to educating policymakers and the public about the advantages of implementing a basic income plan in the United States. The Universal Income Project is funded by Share Progress, a tech startup that works to enhance the reach and resources of progressive organizations. Later in our conversation, Jim will tell us more about the Universal Income Project and about Share Progress. In terms of background, Jim holds a BS in electrical and computer engineering from Caltech and a PhD in distributed robotics from the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. He has worked as a software engineer for a variety of progressive causes, including Obama for America, Organizing for America, and Rebuild the Dream. Since 2015, he has been co-pilot of the Universal Income Project. Welcome, James Pugh. Thank you, Suzanne. I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, we're thrilled to have you. So to begin, could you please tell our viewers something about universal basic income? What is meant by universal basic and what kind of income are you talking about? Sure. So universal basic income or UBI for short, as people will sometimes call it, is a program that would provide every member of society with regular cash that's sufficient to cover their basic needs. So you can imagine every single person in the country receiving a check or a direct deposit into their bank account, perhaps every month for somewhere around $1,000, which would be enough for them to cover their fundamentals, food, clothing, potentially housing, although it can be a little tricky in California, but this would be a program that would be for all. So unlike the means of social support that exists today that make people really prove they're worthy by going through a typically pretty arduous enrollment process, this would just be something that was always there, was always supporting people. So people often describe it as an income floor. So that guarantees no matter what your situation, no matter what happens to you, you'll always be able to rely on that fundamental income to cover those basic expenses. Right. 
Uh, could you give us a, a little bit of a background? How how did this idea develop? Who who first thought of it, and how how did it did, did it have any different variants, and how, how has it arrived to where it is today? So the idea has actually been around for a very very long time. If you look back in the history, you'll see early proposals dating back to the time of the Greek uh, the Greek Empire, uh, ancient Greece, where people were talking about this idea that maybe everyone should be guaranteed a, a fixed amount every month to be able to, to pay for the fundamentals. Typically, who you hear is the first person who fully proposed the idea is founding father Thomas Paine. He wrote about it in, in some of his early writings around the time of the American Revolution, saying just by virtue of the fact that all of us exist, that we are on the land that produces wealth for us collectively, all of us should be entitled to some basic amount that we receive on an ongoing basis. And so that really planted a seed, I would say, in particularly in American culture for thinking about this idea. There was really a revival uh, back in the 1960s and early 70s. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a big, big proponent. It was, in fact, the number one policy idea that he was promoting in the time shortly before his death, the idea of a guaranteed income in the United States. But it was also supported by some folks who were far more conservative. Uh, libertarian economist Milton Friedman was a big fan of the plan. And in fact, there was uh, nearly a, a sort of guaranteed income, universal basic income program that was enacted under the Nixon administration uh, that would have provided every every family, every lower income family in the country with, with a fixed amount of income on an ongoing basis. These days, really all over the map, lots of folks uh, are interested in it as we think about what it means to chart a path forward in, in our modern economy and think about how we as, as a country can really take the next step forward to providing people with fundamental support. Uh, yes. Um, it's, it's my understanding that that one uh, recent uh, threat, if you will, that, that's given it some impetus uh, is the possibility of widespread automation. Is that right? Yeah, honestly, that was one of the reasons I first became interested in, in the policy was thinking about what our future might look like if, if we were to have computer technology and robots advance to a point where really they could do most of the work that needs to be doing in society. And so that, that was what got me interested in it. I know it's what's gotten a lot of other people interested in it. I think that as I dug more into the idea and into the way our society operates today, I shifted from thinking about UBI as more response to some future automation and more as something that we need now. That if you look at the level of financial insecurity that already exists in our society today, and how that's really blocking people from a lot of opportunity and, and being able to live their fullest lives, that having a UBI would just make things so much better and unlock so much potential in our society than we currently have. Uh, I certainly concur with that, but it, it does occur to me, we'll probably talk more about this a bit later, but, but the, the issue in the United States is, generally very heavily oriented towards whether people deserve or don't deserve. And I, I think the appeal of the automation uh, rationale uh, is that if, if uh, large numbers of, of middle-class people were pushed out of their jobs due to automation, well, we might wanna do something for them uh, as opposed to the current situation uh, where many people believe that uh, after all, we have what, a three and a half percent unemployment rate. So, so uh, really, if you, uh, uh, if you don't wanna be poor, you don't have to be poor. I think that depending on where you live that and who you are, that can certainly be true. But if you look at, uh, while we overall, we do have a three and a half percent unemployment rate, that rate varies a lot by demographic, it varies a lot by region. And there's some areas where it can be far more challenging, um, certainly to get a good job and, and sometimes just to get any job than it is today. And what, what I've seen come out of the work I've done around UBI in talking to people uh, who are struggling today is that sometimes it's not just a question of whether you have a job or not, but what kind of job that is and whether it really gives you a path forward. Because there's a lot of jobs that exist that are 
paying people barely, barely enough to get by. Sometimes they're having to work two or even three jobs. And when you're in that situation, it can be so hard to actually even find the time to figure out how to better your situation. And so by having that underlying income floor, by providing that for financial stability, what that can do is even people who are working, that may open up new opportunities for them to also pursue further education or to explore maybe a new idea for a company they want to do themselves, um, or just to look for how they can be honestly contributing to society in other perhaps better ways than is currently possible. And so I think that sometimes just looking at the top line job numbers can give us a false impression of some of the stress that people are, are really facing today. Well, that's certainly a very good point. Uh, I think also uh, viewers may not be aware, but they, there are a lot of people, um, the unemployment rate only counts people who are looking for work. Uh, so th there are a lot of people who have dropped out of the labor force altogether because they feel that as you describe, uh, uh, the jobs jobs demand uh, a lot more uh, from people uh, these days, and uh, people don't have control over their schedules, and they don't they don't have health care, so forth and so on. And so sometimes, uh, when you work all that out, it, it you may not feel it's worth working. So uh, the unemployment rate is perhaps a little bit misleading in terms of, of of the demand for work, but it's a question of what kind of work. Um, before we move uh, a little further, I, 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 I want to get back uh, to the matter of, uh, of universal. Um, so you, you mentioned that, that the idea, uh, as it's been popularized in the U.S., is that everyone um, should have uh, be eligible. Um, would that mean, uh, for example, people in our prisons or, or people released from our prisons? Yeah, I mean, universal means universal, that it, it would be everyone. And I think particularly, um, you mentioned people released from prisons, and I think that's actually a really good okay. population to focus on, because oftentimes, many in our society look at folks in that situation and say, oh, these people don't deserve support. They've committed a crime. We should not be spending our money to make their lives any better. But if you think about how that plays out in practice, what you have, people coming out of the prison system are among the most financially stressed and at risk of falling into deep poverty, um, which oftentimes translates into then engaging in criminal activity because they often don't have any other recourse as far as being able to pay for their basic needs. And so having an underlying income floor, just to, again, enough to provide for basic needs for folks in that situation actually could be transformative in a positive way, not just for them, but for our society at large, because we will be better off if those people aren't returning to a life of crime, if we're actually giving them a path forward so they can figure out how they can be productive and how they can contribute. Uh, there's actually been a couple of pilot programs providing basic income to people returning from incarceration. And they've seen really, really positive results that those folks, so many of them actually do find productive work and are reintegrated in, in a good way into society. And so I think that's one of the, honestly, the appeals of UBI, of universal basic income, is that it moves us away from that decision making about who is and is not deserving of support in our society and says that if you exist, if you live in the United States, then you get this basic income floor. And as a result, even though on the individual level, you may scratch your head a bit about like, should I really be helping this person out? What we see is that we are creating this better past trajectory um, that for society as a whole um, ends up making making our lives much much better because you don't have the social costs of poverty of people turning to crime of the strains honestly on our healthcare system because being poor is one of the most um, most harmful things for for people's health so that by putting the system in place for everyone we actually are are benefiting even even those of us who are already doing quite well Great. Well, that that's interesting. We'll maybe talk a little bit more about 
pilot projects in a, in a minute. That that's that's fascinating information. Um, unfortunately, I don't know how how interested our policymakers are sometimes and and what uh, research shows. But but uh, I would say that's that's very convincing. Um, what about undocumented immigrants? I think that that's definitely a controversial area. Um, we aren't, we, we, as you as you mentioned, we aren't to the point where we're having serious conversations about a full federal universal basic income. So there hasn't been much conversation there. Um, although I think you can get a sense from some of the conversations that have been had around the child tax credit proposal at the federal level. That that's been an area where a lot of people who work on universal basic income have been paying close attention. Because during the pandemic, the program, which up till now provided families with children with a one-time payment when they filed taxes, it was turned into a program where it instead provided a larger ongoing payment that was distributed monthly to families with kids. And that payment not only went to full citizen families, but it went to families where the parents might be undocumented, um, as long as their kids had, had social security numbers. But that was controversial because, again, the, the parents who are receiving the money might might not be citizens or, or might not have legal residence even. Um, but I think that there's there's often a sense um, that there isn't any political will to be able to support people who are, are undocumented. But this, this actually was an instance at the federal level where some support was going to them. As far as whether we should or should not do it, different UBI advocates have different opinions. Mine is that we should. Going back to my point earlier, that when we leave anyone out from universal basic income programs, we are allowing poverty to persist in this country, and that has a cost for all of us. And so that even though uh, people may question, like, should these people get, get money, um, if we're thinking about the broader social good, there's actually real benefit to making sure they're included as well. Well... I would just just kind of add that I don't I don't think I think a lot of people would agree with what you said. I think the problem is that the potential incentives that we don't whether we really don't need any greater incentives to bring people I, to the country than are already out there. And I, I think that that's a great point. And some of the proposals, and in fact, one of the ones my organization put out there back in 2016 um, said that. If you're undocumented, you could, you could receive a, a UBI, but only if you could show that you'd been in the country for several years. And so you wouldn't be able to just yeah. come in and start receiving it. But if you really had set up your life here over the course of several okay. years, you, you would then be eligible for it. I guess another another advantage, though, of, of just being universal and, and not futzing about it is the administrative costs. I mean, already, if you start saying, well, you know, this people need to show the, they've been here and, and all this, you're already introducing all kinds of administrative, you know, bureaucratic overlay that, that, that's costly, actually, and that may, that may cost more than, uh, than the price of not using it at all. Yeah, that's absolutely true, that there's definitely cost savings to be had by not trying to be very precisely targeted and saying, okay, you do or don't qualify. Um, and on the flip side, if you look at programs that do try to very carefully target and only give to certain groups and not others, oftentimes what ends up happening is that you that administrative burden also falls on the people trying to get the benefit. And so many of them run, in, run to a wall there and don't get it. And so if you look at the rate of if you look at who's eligible for programs and how many actually receive it, very targeted programs tend to have often a very low percentage of people who actually receive support. So another advantage of universality is it likely would mean that the people, poor people, people who need it most in this country, more of them would actually end up receiving the benefit. Yeah, I, I think that that's pretty much what, what I, I think research shows, uh, which years ago in the 60s, when I was a young woman, uh, there was this huge problem in New York because 
uh, people went out of their way to publicize uh, what kind of benefits people were available uh, eligible for. They had no idea. Uh, those benefits had been there for years. People had not been taking advantage of them because they didn't know. Right. All of a sudden, right. you know, there were huge lines. So, uh, so there is this this matter of uh, let's just say administrative barriers. We call it that. Uh, so we've been, been making a pretty good case here, I, I, I think, uh, together for, for this program. Uh, maybe we ought to stop and take stock a little bit. In, in your view, Jim, what are, are the most uh, cogent, compelling arguments against a universal basic income? I mean, a big one is that it would be a huge effort that it's this is really at a scale and uh using a model that we we haven't done yet and so it would require a lot of upfront investment to to actually build the systems to be able to reach all the people across the country um so that certainly would be a large amount of work to be done and i think a lot of people who tend to uh prefer to have a more of a status quo bias to think let's stick with what we're doing and just make tweaks around the edges um, there's, it's, it can be pretty unattractive for that reason. Um, beyond that, um, there are, um, I mean, there's, I can give you other common concerns. I think most of them are ones I don't really agree with. Um, certainly a lot of people have fears that if we had a UBI, that it would mean a lot of people would drop out of the labor force because they were getting, uh, an income floor able to cover their basic needs. All the research that has been done on this to date suggests that if, if that were to happen, the effect would be quite, quite small, um, somewhere on the order of around perhaps 5% of people. Um, and that if you look at who drops out of labor force, um, nearly everyone, it's either um, parents with young children who are choosing to stay at home with them longer, or young people who are choosing to go to school for longer. And so while those people wouldn't be working in the economy today and contributing to GDP, they're engaging in behavior that is very pro-social. It's, I mean, if you're at home with your kids, you're creating a environment that hopefully will allow them to thrive more. If you're getting more education, you're bettering yourself. And so in the long run, hopefully you can get a better job. Um, beyond that, um, well, what about the cost? Yeah. Uh, the, the criticism yeah. that I've heard most is, well, how much will it cost and how can we pay for it? Yeah. So I think that that's certainly one that folks commonly bring up. Um, I think that oftentimes what people frame as cost is actually more a question of political will. Um, because if you look at how much it would cost to provide a, a universal basic income, um, even if you were to entirely just say, we want a universal basic income, we're not going to increase, um, uh, or we're not, uh, and, and look at what that would cost in terms of our country's gross domestic product. Um, it would mean that you would have somewhere on, around an additional, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to make sure my math isn't out of date here. Um, but basically, um, to increase our tax burden to be able to fully pay for a universal basic income um, would shift the amount the U.S. taxes today to something more in line with um, most Western European countries. So it would it would mean increasing taxes, but not to a level that is beyond what many countries are able to handle today. And so, but I would say. Um, that's obviously a very abstract answer to your question. Um, perhaps a more immediate one is uh, the, the proposal that Universal Income Project tends to favor for federal policy here um, is that we would create a UBI, everyone gets their payment every month, um, but at the same time, we would institute a new form of taxation so that as people earn income, they would effectively pay back their UBI payment. And so that if you're earning money every month, if you're earning say 400% or more of the federal poverty level, you might pay back 90% of the money that you're getting in your basic income payment every month in your taxes. And so what happens overall is that people who aren't earning much are getting a, a full basic income payment every month, um, but people who are earning more, um, it's 
it's more like an advance they're receiving. They just they just pay back as they earn their money. So that the net cost to the country ends up being um, very little, if anything, for, for people who are earning more. Hmm. I, I realize the, the math there may be a little complicated to communicate. Well, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, two um, th two yeah. thoughts come to my mind. I don't know whether they're the right thoughts. One is that we thought that if we if we let students borrow money to go to college, that they would reap the benefits and be able to pay off the debt. And that was for a variety of reasons, some of which have to do with predatory colleges, but to some extent that was wrong. Uh, I don't know, I guess my own, my own personal feeling would be that there, uh, that that there are are things that uh, there are there are ways uh, there are there are undertaxed groups uh, not so much the main beneficiaries of a possible uh, basic income but uh, uh, people at the top who are uh, mm -hmm. and corporations at the top who are who are in this country consistently getting away with paying way uh, way less than their fair share. Um, I would perhaps personally prefer yeah. maybe going going in that direction. Um, and I should note that um, that the the other part the the system I mentioned, which is called a transfer repayment tax, that would reduce the overall cost of a basic income by about two thirds. As far as how do you pay for the remainder? Absolutely, looking at more progressive income taxation, perhaps considering wealth taxes, things like carbon taxes that actually penalize um, polluters. There's a number of ways that you can raise considerably more than is needed to, to cover the remaining cost. Right. Okay, well, it is what it is. And of course, it's a great idea uh, how feasible it is in America right now. It's hard to gauge, but there are there, there is some background. I think we should turn now maybe to some instances where something of the kind has actually been in practice and, and talk a little bit about, about how, how that's worked out. And, and the first spot that, that occurred to me was, was Saudi Arabia, where, where uh, there's my understanding that there are in some of the other Gulf states that uh, I guess they're just so wealthy, they don't know what to do with it all. So they decided to share it with, with their citizens. Could, could you tell us a little bit about that, Jim? Yeah, there's definitely examples in a, in a number of Middle Eastern countries um, where be, because of oil wealth there, they, they have a lot of money to work with, as you say. And part of what they've done with that is they will provide their citizens with cash stipends. Um, the form that's taken varies across the country, uh, but sometimes it has been quite, quite generous. Um, that honestly, I actually think that's an example of an argument for universality, because what has played out in many cases is that those countries, the citizenship sometimes is a minority of the residents, because they will bring in a lot of people from other countries as workers there. And so what that has done in practice is it's it's created a very much of a class separation between citizens there and others, because the citizens receive such generous support, none of which is available to the workers coming in. And so that's, I, I think, in, in some ways, a somewhat dystopian outcome that I, I, I sometimes worry about as, as we talk about, not, not just with UBI, different versions, but our policy proposals more generally. But when we look at programs that focus on some, not all, that we, we create a divide that really ends up, again, not just creating a, a bad situation for people who are receiving the support, but making it tough for everyone. Because oftentimes th those are also situations where having to avoid the consequences of the poverty from the broader population and ends up really making life um, more difficult for people broadly as far as as far as crime, as far as feeling like you're living in a, a safe and clean community. Right. So, um, so in Saudi Arabia, uh, all all Saudi citizens are are eligible, uh, right? For so, what has this done uh, to the work ethic of of Saudis? Do, do, do you know anything about that or? Uh, I, what what other some other uh, has it or conversely um, has it reduced crime among 
uh, Saudis. I mean, just in terms of some of the uh, pros and cons that, that we already talked about or might be associated with universal basic income, how, how has that played out? Or do you feel that, that because, yes, I mean, I, there are a very large proportion, it's even possible there are more immigrants in some of these Gulf states, uh, just temporary immigrants, construction and so on, then there are residents. Or is it that the that the that that there's just so many immigrants and uh, non-citizens that there's really impossible to take a barometer uh, that would give us a sense of the effect, uh, efficacy of universal basic income in the Gulf? I honestly haven't seen any studies around that. I think those programs, um, from my understanding, they mostly haven't been consistent ongoing regular that they'll have they'll have occasional stipends they might have annual support um, and often if not cash other forms of support that they're providing to to citizens there so um I and, and for that reason I'm, I'm not super super familiar with all the dynamics there um I have not seen as I said any studies about what impact those programs have had though Okay, well, uh, maybe viewers that are interested, in, uh, the internet is always f full of information. You can yep. uh, look into it some more. What, what about Alaska then? Uh, don't, uh, which again shows us the value of oil. Don't, don't they as an oil state uh, also offer, perhaps it is their citizens, uh, some, uh, some form of subsidy? Yes, and I, I think Alaska is definitely one that is often looked to by people within the, the UBI community as an example of what we might be working towards more broadly and scaling up. So more than 40 years ago now, Alaska was having an oil boom. And as a result, the, the payments they were receiving from companies extracting oil made the state completely flush with cash. And amongst other things, the governor at the time decided we're gonna take a large chunk of the money that we're receiving from that oil and we're going to create a sovereign wealth fund, a uh, fund where that money went into it, which was invested. So not only would they be in the money, the investment would be growing over time and be building up. And so that fund was created. And several years later, they amended the plan for that to say, we're also going to take the returns on that fund and we're going to pay it out as a universal dividend to all residents of Alaska. And when I say all, I mean all. If you were living in Alaska for one year, doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter how much money you were earning, uh, doesn't matter if you had a job or not, you would receive an annual check for a certain amount of money. The amount started relatively small, but as more and more money poured into the fund from the oil revenue, um, it got larger and larger to the point where now, typically every year, every Alaskan receives a check for somewhere in the order of $1,500. So... That's not at a level of a full basic income. You can't live off of $1,500 a year, but it's a good chunk of money. And particularly when you think about it, this is for everyone. If you have a family, two parents and three kids, they're going to receive five dividends every year because they have five family members. So if they would be receiving $1,500 for one person, that's $7,500 that family is getting once a year, which is real money. Uh, and so they've had this program around now, as I said, for decades, um, and people there love it, that it's, it's incredibly popular um, to the point where Alaska's actually had some, some budget issues as, as her oil money has decreased, and po some politicians have proposed to raid that fund, and the backlash from people there has just been incredibly severe. They're, they're saying like, no, this is our money, we need our dividend every year. And so regardless of whether you're a Democrat or Republican or independent, it's just extremely popular. And people just see it as a right of being an Alaskan. You get that dividend check every year um, coming from the, those funds that came from New Orleans State. I'm, I'm going to tease you and, and ask a question. Um, has anyone taken a look at the birth rate to determine whether uh, the additional income uh, has increased the birth rate as uh, some people on the right have argued that uh, <laughs> people have extra children so that they can get uh, welfare checks? Um, I don't remember if anyone has looked at that or not, to be honest. Um... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. As I said, the, the payments early on were smaller, so it might be hard to, to choose a single point in time where 
it was seen as much more compelling to do that. Um, but people have certainly looked at other things, including impact on labor rates, um, and found that uh, there's no there was no detectable impact on on full time employment. Um, cabin dividend versus not. There was comparisons between Alaska versus other parts of the country that had similar characteristics before and after the dividend. And again, it just that they weren't seeing uh, cases of of people dropping out of the workforce because they were getting some extra cash support. What about wages? Wages might be lower. Um, I don't recall whether that was analyzed. Yeah. Um, I mean that that certainly people will raise that concern. If obviously if you're getting income from elsewhere, could employers lower wage, wages? But on the flip side. People, uh, a lot of people who are connected to organized labor like the idea of UBI because it, it sort of provides a strike fund where mm -hmm. if you decide your workplace is not actually treating you fairly, whether from low wages or, or bad working conditions, you have much more of an opt out than you do today because you know you'll have that guaranteed income there waiting for you. Right. Well, I would suggest that we switch our focus to the, what do they call them? The lower 48, because actually one of the issues with comparing Alaska to the lower 48, Alaska is uh, not comparable to most other states, even when I'm thinking about, about wages or labor force participation or whatever, it's dark half the year. You know, you can't really control for that and find another state where that, where that obtains or uh, the wage, I believe, you know, everything is more there because it's more remote and so forth. So, so if we want to understand the, the impact of uh, a basic income in the United States, it might be better uh, if we forgot about Alaska and take a look at uh, some of the pilot studies that that I know uh, you know a lot about, uh, you've already uh, mentioned, referenced a couple. So, so we have had a, a few uh, experiments in the U.S. Could you tell us about some of the ones you know something about? And what did, how do they work and what did they find? Yeah. So if we're talking about experiments, I, sh I should start by saying there were actually a few experiments that were run in the late 1960s and early 70s in the US around the time that the Nixon administration was considering establishing a, a guaranteed income program for the country. Um, and so they looked at what happened with families where they, they guaranteed that baseline of income for them. Um, generally what they found is um, people reported better well-being generally. Um, there was a slight, as I said, decrease in, in workforce participation, but the numbers were fairly low. Um, they didn't look too much beyond that at that point. Um, but luckily, there have been some more recent pilot programs that have been run in, in the US. Um, probably the most notable one in recent history was run in Stockton, California. Um, and that was launched in, or it was announced in 2017, it was run in 2018 through 2020, I believe is when it ended. Um, and they provided um, a group of Stocktonians with $500 per month over the course of two years. And it was unconditional. They could do whatever they wanted with that cash. Once they were in the program, it was guaranteed for them throughout the entire pilot period. Uh, and they looked at what happened. To people. These were all these were people who had below median income in in the city. So, on the lower scale of the income income spectrum, but not necessarily extreme poverty. Um, and what they uh, what they recorded by looking at what people spent money on and, and what they reported as far as their living situation. Um, not surprisingly, people reported much more financial stability having that underlying income floor. Um, they reported that they were um, fewer cases of hunger. They were able to more consistently make sure they had enough food. Um, spending data, they looked at what people spent it on. Um, food and day-to-day -day goods like clothing, car insurance, stuff like that was a significant majority of, of what people spent on. Um, there was uh, like a small amount of spending on things like going to the movies or going out to dinner. Um, but it, by and large, it seemed like people were, were spending the money on what they needed to be able to get by. Um, and 
People uh, reported um, improvements in their health, both mental health and physical health. Um, and one of the things that I, I know surprised a lot of people is that um, they looked at people's employment traits at the beginning of the pilot and the end of the pilot compared to the people in that similar population at large. And the people on the program ended up getting full-time employment at a higher rate than the people who weren't receiving those basic income payments. Mm -hmm. And what was what a few people shared is that having that extra financial flexibility actually opened new doors for them. They were able to, to take that night class or um, be able to, to save up some money needed for uh, an initial investment to be able to, to start some, some form of new work. Um, and so that, that enabled them to be able to, to achieve that better outcome over the course of the pilot program. Um, since then, sorry, you look like you had a question. Yeah, well, I was just wondering, uh, how are these people selected? Do you know, the, the recipients? So they, uh, what Stockton did is that they, they identified zip codes in the city that had lower income people, um, and they sent out invitations to people across the zip codes to apply for the program. So self-selection. So they could select in, but then there were far, far more people than, than they could actually provide the basic income through the pilot. So they randomly selected them amongst the people who applied. So it wasn't, it, it was a relatively small group. There was 125 people in, in the pilot, mm -hmm. um, but they tried to do it in a way that, that would be fair as far as letting anyone who was interested, who, who met the income criteria, um, be able to participate with an equal chance. So since that's happened, um, there have been a number of other pilot programs around basic income that have popped up across the country. Um, in fact, the, the former now former mayor of Stockton, Michael Tubbs, who launched the basic income program there, founded an organization called Mayors for Guaranteed Income. And um, between those programs and, and some, some other basic income programs that cities and states have launched on their own, there's over 100 pilot programs now across the country um, that have either begun or have, have been announced and are in the process of, of launching. Um, still very few of them have concluded. There's only, I would say less, I'm pretty sure less than 10 at this point that, that have concluded um, because this, this has been so recent that there's there's been so much interest here. So we don't yet have tons of data as far as what the outcomes will be there, but you do see um, you see places all, all across the country, including some, some you might not expect. Birmingham, Alabama is, is working on their pilot program. Um, you have a number of places in the, in the Midwest. Uh, who are launching it. Um, and so we're going to get a, a very diverse set of ge ge geographic data coming out of these pilots. Um, and at the same time, some of the programs are choosing to focus on specific populations. I mentioned that there have been a few pilot programs now for people returning from incarceration. Uh, there's one in Oakland, where I live, that um, has been underway. Gainesville, Florida is also in the process of doing one. Um, and I believe there's there's one or two others in, in different cities across the country. Um, there's been, uh, particularly in California, a lot of interest around providing something, some sort of basic income to people who are unhoused um, as a way of potentially supplying them with financial resources to be able to resolve their homelessness. Um, so that's, there's pilot programs for that running in New York, in Denver, um, and a couple other cities are in the process of, of gearing up to launch that right now as well. Um, so yeah, there's just a, a lot of interest in exploring what, what difference a basic income and, and this unconditional cash can make for people in different challenges in their lives. And I, I think the more that we can, all, all these pilots, I think not, we both gain the evidence coming out of them to be able to more deeply understand the effect um, but we also can see, we, we can hear the stories about what people's lives are like prior to and receiving that um, to better understand um, the, the situation that people are in. Because I think oftentimes it's easy to think about people in tough situations as having some sort of internal fault that put them in that situation and be able to see that oftentimes it's not that they, it's not that they made a mistake, it's that the system that they were in, the situation they were born into, put them on a path towards that, and that having those financial resources really gives them a, a new chance at being able to succeed in life. Great. Uh, 
let me, so what you're really saying is that at this historical moment, um, and I would like to, you to tell me what, what is the reason, uh, and there's uh, more interest than there's been for a really long time, because um, these pilot programs are not cheap. Um, so, yeah. and, and they, they involve actually very, very, a lot of resources. It's not like, you know, running a little poll or something. These are complicated kind of like, uh, you know, stuff that, that we used to do with Head Start or, or other, other programs that, that really are major interventions. So I wonder if you could sort of answer this double-barreled question of, of sort of wh why do you think there's an interest now and who's funding it? So I, I think there's a couple of reasons it's high now. Um, I think we'll get into it more talking about um, the history of my organization. But when I, when I started work in the basic income space seven years ago, almost no one was talking about this. And certainly no one saw it as a policy that we expected to have any viability anytime in the near future. Um, since then, I think a few things have happened. Um, I think that there, with the 2016 elections in the US, I think there was a shift in what people saw as plausible as far as outcomes in this country. And I think that made people take a step back from assumptions about the way things, the way that things work right now is the way things they will, way they will always work. Um, I think added to that, as you mentioned, concerns about automation, that certainly has been um, a driver for people questioning the, the way that our, our work environment operates across the United States and whether we might need to, to rethink the structures around that. And then honestly, most recently, I would say the COVID pandemic. Um, has really been a big, big factor because understanding that the way the sort of the sort of safety net that we all have in different capacities may not work very well in the face of a global pandemic. And so that we may need to rethink how we actually provide people with support. And particularly because of things like stimulus checks, and as I mentioned, the expansion of the child tax credit to provide monthly payments, the idea of unconditional regular cash support as a way that people can be helped has just gained a lot more credibility. And so that you now have far, far more people, both in positions of power and I would say generally across the country, who are looking at that as, as a vehicle for by which we might be able to support people. And so that brings us much closer to a policy like EPI. Um, again, it's, it's a bigger scale than what we've seen to date, but as far as the way that we as a country are approaching providing people with financial security, it's a lot more similar to some of the things that we've seen in the last few years than prior to that point. And, and the resources for these pilots so is coming from foundations, right. federal government, the it's a mix. Um, there's been, there's certainly been interest in from certain parts of philanthropy in this. Um, there's been a number of, of wealthy people in Silicon Valley who have been interested in UBI and then put some money behind the effort. Um, but honestly, a lot of the pilot programs that have popped up in the last uh, year or two, it's so a lot of the money has come from um, the um, the uh, pandemic response legislation, the stimulus bills um, that were passed to provide cities and states with with money to help people recover. Um, oftentimes, those funds have been directed to to doing these basic income programs as a way of getting cash directly into the hands of residents, as opposed to taking more circuitous routes. Oh, oh, that's fascinating! Wow. So there are some positive. Uh, feedback coming out of this uh, dreadful pandemic. Huh. Who knew? Well, so um, I think this is a very good time for you to tell us about uh, about your work with the Universal Income Project and and also uh, how it how it gets funded. Yeah, absolutely. So I, as I said, I've been working on universal basic income for a little over seven years now. Um, I co-founded Universal Income Project 
in uh, late 2015, uh, along with a few other people who were coming from the political space as I was, and were interested in, in thinking a bit more outside the box as far as how we might support people today. Um, and so we, at that point, our goal was really just, let's start a conversation. We want people to start talking about and, and thinking about this idea as, as maybe something to consider for, for the future. Um, and uh, what we saw though is honestly faster than any of us predicted, interest grew, people started talking more about the idea. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the few events um, of the 2016 election, um, the concerns around automation and, and then the COVID pandemic, it really drove more and more people to start being interested in the idea and talking about it more seriously. Um, and so at this point, Universal Income Project, we really focus, it's less on getting the word out and it's more on actually what do we mean when we say policy um, and thinking about what is the path forward as far as being able to do these basic income programs, um, sometimes at the city level, sometimes at the state level, um, and sometimes at the federal level. Um, so looking at what, what can happen today and how we can be laying the groundwork for future larger scale programs. Um, because the more that this can be adopted and experimented with and normalized at the, the state and local level, the better position will be to be able to pass federal policy um, at whatever point in the future where, where there's a window of opportunity to move that forward. Um, as far as the funding approach, um, as you noted, uh, Universal Income Project is uh, funded through Share Progress, which is actually a company that I started back in 2013, so almost 10 years ago now. Um, and the company um, provides uh, software tools for, for nonprofit advocacy organizations um, to help them with their campaigning work, as well as um, some consulting services connected to that. Um, but that's actually been the vehicle by which um, Universal Income Projects has been able to do most of its work, um, is that the, the, the revenue that comes in from the company has, has funded um, a lot of our costs um, and enabled us to, to do this work. Um, which I, I mean, I see as, as complementary to, to part of supporting this um, progressive advocacy more generally. Um, could you tell us a little bit more uh, about, about the kinds of activities um, uh, uh, that Universal Income Project has done? I mean, I, uh, I understand or you, you, have, you have occasional podcasts or you, uh, you have uh, some kinds of uh, weekend brainstorming events or could you talk a little about that? Yeah, so back the, the, our big first event back when we were trying to really raise awareness around the idea of UBI was we organized what we called a create-a-thon. And this was a weekend event where we invited interested people to come together and to brainstorm ideas for projects. Very broad definition, any sort of project you want. It could be a video, it could be a song, it could be a story, it could be a computer program but around on the theme of universal basic income. And the intention there was to, it was very much inspired by um, the hackathon model, um, which is something that's been, become quite popular in Silicon Valley, where a lot of people who work in tech will come together and spend a weekend working on a, on a particular area. Um, we didn't want to limit it to just technologists, which is why we went with the create-a-thon model. And so very intentionally, we're inviting people who were doing art, doing writing, um, doing um, whatever form of creativity and creation um, they came from um, to be able to participate in this event. Um, and we had, when we launched that, we really didn't know what to expect. Um, we thought maybe we'll have 10, 15 people show up and who knows what they'll create. Within 48 hours of hosting the event on social media, we already had more than 100 people who had RSVP'd to the event. Um, and ended up having uh, about that many people join join for that weekend and, and work on these different projects. And that was really a moment when I, and I think some of the others involved knew that we were tapping into something here, that there was really a lot of interest and eagerness to explore this idea. And so following up from that, um, we looked for other ways to be able to get the word out. We would organize monthly events in the Bay Area, uh, bringing in speakers who could talk about UBI from different perspectives, um, 
share whatever projects they were working on in the space. Um, as you noted, we launched a podcast, um, I believe back in 2016, um, where we would put out weekly content um, looking at, at UBI from, from different perspectives, interviewing different people um, to, to get their take on it, talking about past research and also new proposals. Um, we actually wrapped up the podcast in, in 2020. So it's, it's been a while now since we had a new episode, um, but that definitely was a, a big part of the way that we were getting the word out. These days, as I said, it's more focused on policy. Um, so we've done some work at the state level in California um, to set up programs, both to um, explore basic income. To uh, We worked with uh, the state social services department around the fund to support basic income pilot programs across the state, um, as well as how to provide underlying support for that sort of work. Um, one of the big concerns with pilot programs is that as people are signing up for these and getting cash, um, sometimes they're at risk of losing essential benefits um, that they might otherwise be receiving. If you're receiving, if you're on Medi-Cal and you're getting your healthcare treatment from that, you don't want to have a surprise of suddenly losing your eligibility because you're participating in, in this basic income program. And so working with the state to make sure there is a way to protect benefits for, for the people who are being involved there. Um, and at the same time, just looking for ways um, to be able to provide provide tools and then um, to promote a narrative around basic income that helps to familiarize people with it and, and have it be something that's seen not only as more normal, um, because a lot of people react to hearing unconditional cash by feeling like that can't be right. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, so being able to tell the story of how this actually works in practice, um, but also something that, that people support more um, because at the end of the day, uh, the political situation in Washington is ultimately going to reflect where public sentiment is across the country. And so if over time, people more and more are getting used to the idea and supporting the idea of having EBI here, that's going to put us in a much a better and better position as far as being able to actually enact federal legislation. I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, I didn't get to all the questions I had in mind, but I think uh, I think we have uh, really got a good overview uh, of this, this wonderfully exciting, actually not new, but perhaps uh, new to Americans idea of how how to improve uh, our standard of living for everyone. So concerned citizens, thanks, Jim Pugh, for enlightening us about the benefits of implementing a basic NCHEM program and for providing suggestions about how to advance this wonderful idea. And concerned citizens, thanks you, our viewers, for spending an hour with us. We look forward to seeing you again next time.